30 is Friday, so we're celebrating vision research. I'm really delighted to welcome all of you uh, for this series of our seminars. Um, now will be every week uh, with no more breaks. So this is really wonderful. Uh, one of the my special time during the week. I wanted to thank Grazina for uh, putting a list of uh, invited speakers. And again, this year, we have a phenomenal group of uh, vision researchers, leaders in our field. Uh, so please uh, join us every week and you know, enjoy a very short presentation of their life uh, passion in research. So um, with that, I would like to again uh, thank you also, Anna for, uh, and Tim, for keeping this uh, series running so smoothly in the past year. Hopefully, the same will be repeated this year. And with that, uh, obviously, we have a fantastic uh, inaugural this year, 2024 academic year uh, speaker. So I will let uh, Priya to introduce our speaker. A very good morning, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Yoga Priya Sundaresan, postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Zore's lab. Today, I'm honored to introduce uh, the speaker, Dr. Adriana DiPolo. Dr. DiPolo is a professor in the Department of Neuroscience and Ophthalmology at the University of Montreal, Quebec, Canada, since the year 2000. She holds the Canada Research Chair in Glaucoma and Age-Related Neurodegeneration. Dr. DiPolo completed her BS in Biology from Universidad Central de Venezuela, and her PhD in physiology from University of California, Los Angeles. She then pursued her postdoctoral training at the Center for Research in Neuroscience at McGill University, Quebec, Canada. Dr. DiPolo's research program focuses on understanding mechanisms of neuronal, glial, and vascular deficits in glaucoma. The primary goal of her laboratory is to develop regenerative and neuroprotective therapies to restore retinal ganglion cell function. She has received several research funding and currently is the principal investigator on grants from the Canadian Institute of Health Research, National Institute of Health, the Department of Defense United States, Alcon Research Institute, Bright Focus Foundation, Glaucoma Foundation, and other competitive grants from nonprofit organizations as well as industries. In addition, Dr. DiPolo serves on many executive and scientific boards, including the NIH Audacious Goals Initiative, Bright Focus Foundation, Glaucoma Research, and she also served as the chair of the Canadian Institute of Health Research, Clinical and System Neuroscience Panel. She's the current director of the Retina and Posterior Segment Group of Quebec Vision Health Research Network and the president of Canadian Association for Neuroscience. She's an RO Gold Fellow and has received many awards, including Foundation Fighting Blindness Young Investigator Award, the 2019 Schaffer's Prize from Glaucoma Research Foundation, the 2020 Lewis Juden Glaucoma Research Prize, and 2023 Alcon Research Institute Senior Investigator Award. Dr. Dipola is deeply committed to teaching and training vision uh, scientists at all level of education, and she served women in the Women in Eye and Vision Research Committee from 2017 to 2020. With that introduction, please join me to invite Dr. Dipola to deliver a talk titled Early Mechanisms of Neuronal and Vascular Damage in Glaucoma. Dr. Dipola. Thank you, thank you so much. That was such a kind and, and generous introduction. I, I was feeling a little tired listening to you talk about everything uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that you mentioned, but I appreciate it deeply. And it's really an honor to be here to give the inaugural uh, talk on, on Friday the 13th. So if, if you're concerned, I just want to uh, you know tell you that in Hispanic culture, Friday the 13th is not a thing. It's Tuesday the 13th, Martes 13. So, so we're good, we're good. It's all good. No bad luck today. So when I was putting together this presentation, I really uh, uh, thought that perhaps I should focus more on, on recent uh, work that we've done, uh, that I want to uh, dive a little bit deeper uh, to explain. So I decided that uh, today I'm not going to cover the vascular aspects of glaucoma, although we do have a really very active research program in this area, I thought it would be better today just to 
uh, tell you about more recent things that we've been doing in terms of understanding neuronal damage in glaucoma. And, and when I say neuronal damage, what I really mean is the death of the retinal ganglion cells or RGCs, as you will see in many of my slides. And the reason, of course, you may know is that uh, loss of vision in glaucoma is caused by the irreversible death of retinal ganglion cells. And these neurons have fascinated me for so many years now. They have this unique and complex cytoarchitecture uh, with the uh, cell body and dendrites within the retina where they receive synaptic inputs from bipolar and amacrine cells. All this information is integrated in the soma and then send down very long axons that form the optic nerve to make synaptic contacts with targets in the brain. So you can imagine that this special cytoarchitecture, this special structure makes perhaps contributes to their high susceptibility by a number of factors, of course in glaucoma, but several other uh, optic neuropathies as well. So my lab is really focused on trying to understand what are the mechanisms that drive retinal ganglion cell damage in glaucoma? And when you think about how these cells die, it's very interesting. They don't die all at the same time and they don't die rapidly. They have this really gradual and progressive pattern of death, which in some glaucoma patients can last for decades. And what's interesting is that uh, um, a lot of uh, Clinical and preclinical studies have shown that retinal ganglion cells enter a dysfunctional phase where they're still not dead, but they're not working properly. They're not functioning in the, in the usual way that they would if they were completely healthy. And so this is interesting because it provides a window of opportunity to perhaps intervene at this stage when they're dysfunctional and try to push them back to a healthier uh, situation and perhaps uh, promote neural recovery. So we're, uh, one of the limitations of this approach is that we don't really understand exactly what is going on at the very early stages of the disease when the cells become dysfunctional. And uh, what we, in my lab, what we're really uh, obsessed about is to uh, really know and understand what's going on within that black box and can we do something to intervene and promote uh, neuroprotection and regeneration and neuro recovery. We have identified some pathways that are involved at the early stages of neurodegeneration and today I will focus specifically on alterations in calcium dynamics as well as dendritic and synaptic loss. Now, the reason we, we decided to look into calcium dynamics is that calcium is the universal readout for neuronal function. So uh, there is a, a wide uh, uh, a range of techniques that allow us to do that and also information showing that calcium activity or calcium signals dynamics mimic uh, very well the activity and the function of neurons in general throughout the nervous system, including retinal ganglion cells. In addition, calcium is perhaps one of the most important, if not the most, one of the most important molecules involved in signaling within neurons. From protein function to a myriad of cellular processes, we couldn't live without calcium. For this reason, and its importance as a signaling component, neurons have to maintain calcium levels very, very low so they can act as signals when the signal is needed. And to do these uh, neurons and, and other cells as well, but because we're talking about neurons, they have implemented a set of uh, processes that keep a very tight regulation on the levels of intracellular calcium, which is in the end going to be a balance between calcium influx through a number of membrane pathways, as well as intracellular stores, and calcium clearance, which are all the mechanisms that are going to be responsible for absorbing, taking away that calcium so the neuron can reset again and start another pattern of firing or activity or signaling. And the clearance is, is a complex process. There's many uh, entities that are probably involved, but it's mainly regulated by organelles such as the endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria, 
as well as other transmembrane uh, pathways. So we decided to investigate how calcium dynamics are affected during glaucoma. And this is the project of a, an exceptional postdoctoral fellow in the lab, Yukihiro Shiga, we call him Hiro, who used a two photon laser scanning microscopy to visualize calcium dynamics in living animals. And this can be done by placing the objective of the microscope on uh, directly on the sclera of living mice. So they, they, these mice are anesthetized, but they're alive. Uh, of course, we use a cover sleep, and then we can uh, provide all sorts of visual stimuli to uh, measure calcium dynamics. This is, uh, these experiments are done in transgenic mice that carry a calcium indicator known as GCAM6, this is a protein that when it binds calcium, it's gonna emit fluorescent, fluorescent, uh, fluorescence, in this case, green fluorescence, green, green fluorescence or for green fluorescent protein. And you can see here, the beautiful retinal ganglion cells expressing GCAM6, and we can visualize them because they're also expressing, of course, a cell-specific marker known as RBPMS, shown here in red, and we use RBPMS fairly routinely to identify retinal ganglion cells. Now, some of you may know that there are over 40 different molecular and physiological subtypes of retinal ganglion cells in the mouse retina. But in humans, the situation is a little bit different. Uh, vision is primarily mediated or, or, or there is a fundamental role of midget retinal ganglion cells in human vision. And in fact, they account for over 80% of uh, the retinal ganglion cells in the human retina. Uh, so recent work from uh, Karthik Shekhar's lab in, and his collaborators at UC Berkeley using integrated single cell transcriptomics and retinal atlases across species have uh, determined or identified um, alpha retinal ganglion cells as the mouse ortholog for midget cells in humans. So uh, what we decided to do was to focus on re alpha retinal ganglion cells for this live uh, imaging study. And you can see here a very nice alpha retinal ganglion cell expressing the calcium indicator GCAM6. And we can identify these cells because they're, they express very abundantly neurofilament H shown here in magenta. So we can do postdoc analysis and, and make sure that we're recording from these cells. Now I'm going to take a little bit of time to explain what are these calcium responses that we're measuring. And, and the reason I'm going to take a little bit of time is that you may enjoy the talk a little bit more if I tell you what, what, you know, what we're looking at rather than show you a bunch of traces and, and graphs and, and lose you in five minutes. So uh, if you bear with me and pay attention, this may be a little bit easier to understand as we go along. So this is the response of an on alpha retinal ganglion cell. When you flash a light on this cell and record calcium signaling using this calcium indicator, what you see is a very fast increase in the calcium signal that we call the rise rate. And this is reflecting influx of calcium into the retinal ganglion cell. Now, this signal is going to reach a peak. That's the maximum amount of calcium that this cell is going to see with these specific stimulus. And then that calcium is going to be very quickly cleared, as I said, to maintain basal levels of calcium within the neuron. And that is called tau decay, which is the time it takes for the calcium levels to go from peak to basal. And that is a measurement of clearance, of calcium clearance, all right? So we're going to look at how these parameters change in glaucoma and with, with different treatments. To assess the effect of glaucomatous damage on these responses, uh, Hero and uh, routinely in the lab, we use a model of ocular hypertension that you will see as an abbreviation OHT in all my slides. So every time you see OHT, it means that these animals have ocular hypertension glaucoma. And the reason we focus on these is, is because uh, ocular hypertension or high intraocular pressure, it's a major risk factor for developing glaucoma in humans. So many glaucoma patients uh, suffer from high intraocular pressure. 
And the way we induce uh, this uh, uh, ocular hypertension in mice is by injecting magnetic microbeads through the cornea into the anterior chamber. We attract them with a magnet to the irritable corneal angle where the trabecular meshwork and the slim canal are located, and that blocks the aqueous humor outflow, outflow pathway, so that leading, leading to a gradual increase in intraocular pressure that is sustained for many, many weeks, allowing us to really look at the pathological changes uh, in the retina caused by elevated pressure. <clears throat> and so here are uh, real time lapse images of uh, changes in fluorescence that reveal calcium dynamic changes in single retinal ganglion cells. So this is a ganglion cell in sham operated controls and in glaucomatous mice with uh, ocular hypertension, OHT. And you can quickly see this is before the light stimulation, but when we flash a light, there is a very rapid increase. Let's focus on the sham uh, cell on the top. There's a very rapid increase in calcium and then a rapid decrease in the calcium signal as well. So there is very good calcium clearance in this cell. But if you look at the cell that was exposed to ocular hypertension, you can see, okay, there's a fast increase in the calcium signal, but it takes a very long time for uh, this calcium signal to go down to baseline levels. In fact, here, after a few seconds and it continues on, it's still this cell hasn't recovered entirely from that initial uh, burst of calcium. And so here's another way to represent this with the trace. You can see there's a delay in the time that it takes for that cell to bring calcium down to basal levels. And we measure these in time. So it takes a lot more time from peak to baseline here. And that's what we call calcium decay. If you focus on this graph here, uh, in orange, you can see that there is in, in, in glaucoma, there's a much longer time for the neuron to decrease calcium levels. So there's it's a higher, a longer time to achieve this calcium clearance, whereas the calcium influx and the amplitude of the response did not change at all. So these results indicate that perhaps there are defects in calcium clearance in retinal ganglion cells going on at this time point. And I forgot to mention that all of this analysis and everything you're going to see regarding uh, the uh, dynamics of calcium in retinal ganglion cells was done at two weeks after magnetic microbial induction. So, induction. so uh, we induced glaucoma, but this is prior to the time when the ganglion cells die. So this is when all retinal ganglion cells are still alive and, but as you can see, begin to have some functional deficits. Now, we wanted to make sure that these results were really true that we didn't we were not seeing some sort of artifact due to our, our calcium imaging so we uh, were very lucky to be able to collaborate with Arjun Krishna Swami at McGill University and his graduate student Alim uh, Rangel and uh, what they the approach that they use is also using two photon uh, microscopy but using retinal explants which allow them to look at many, many different retinal ganglion cells throughout the retina, many, many different subtypes, not just the alpha retinal ganglion cells, but many other types, and then apply a, a suite of stimuli, a stimuli that ranges from bars to sinusoidal waves and color, and then obtain individual tracings of every single retinal ganglion cell they measure. Here in this image, you can see, you cannot see really because the lines are very, very close, but this, each horizontal line is a single retinal ganglion cell, and there's thousands of cells that we recorded from. And uh, after that, they can actually do principal component analysis and identify from this data uh, th uh, different functional clusters, three on cells and four on off retinal ganglion cells. So what happens when uh, they looked at the glaucomatous condition? Well, they found exactly what we saw in the live imaging data. They found that in on retinal ganglion cells, there's an increase in the time that it takes for calcium to be cleared. Same thing for on off cells. And when they pulled all the data together, so thousands of cells, they find, uh, they confirmed actually that 
uh, there was uh, there there is these cells need a lot more time to be able to clear fully calcium. And what's really nice about this work is that when we told them we were going to uh, we send them the mice, so we decided, we told them, you know, we're going to send you mice, but we're not going to tell you what procedure they received or what therapy they received, and you just get to measure and then tell us what you see. And so we were very uh, happy and, and very relieved to, to see that uh, using two different methods of calcium recordings in experts and in vivo, uh, we got a similar results. So together, uh, this in vivo and ex vivo data suggests that there is a reduction in calcium clearance uh, ability by retinal ganglion cells early during glaucomatous damage. And one of the major storage uh, organelles for calcium within neurons is the endoplasmic reticulum. And for that to happen, it relies on an ATPase calcium pump called CIRCA2. Now, uh, you know, there, there could be other pathways that are involved. So we did a, pharmacologic, a pharmacological screening of activators and inhibitors of a number of pathways. And our data together, when we looked at all the data, uh, the uh, what jumped uh, at us was that it looked like the, the deficits that we were seeing were related to deficits in circa two function. And I'm just going to show you quickly two examples where we used a circa two inhibitor called CPA. And then we measured longitudinal changes in calcium dynamics before and after delivery of this circa 2 inhibitor. Now, these are really great experiments because Hero, he can identify a cell and then record the same cell longitudinally before intravitreal injection of this inhibitor and after intravitreal injection. So we are recording from the same cell as it changes, and then we apply different light stimuli. And you can see that with application of the circa 2 inhibitor, there is this very reproducible uh, um, delay in calcium clearance from these cells. And in contrast, when we applied circa 2 activators, such as CDN 1163, just to mention one, we see a reduction, like a sharpening and a decrease in the time required for reducing calcium levels in retinal ganglion cells. This really suggested to us that the problems in circa two, either levels or function, was in behind this calcium clearance defect. To confirm that, we decided to do an in, a, you know a detailed analysis of circa two levels in retinal ganglion cells. We first looked at uh, circa two gene mRNA levels. The gene is called ATP two A two. Uh, we did this by qPCR in whole retinas, but that's also in fact sorted retinal ganglion cells and confirmed that there's a reduction in circa two levels uh, during ocular hypertension. We uh, also measure the protein levels in retinal ganglion cells using flow cytometry, uh, which allows us to quantify uh, proteins uh, selectively in retinal ganglion cells and saw so a decrease. In that, in that, using that technique, and of course, we confirmed these in by immunohistochemistry in mice using an antibody against circa two. You can see very nicely it's decreased in retinal ganglion cells, and interestingly, we also found a decrease in circa two in donor samples from patients with primary open angle glaucoma. So these are postmortem retinas that we uh, were able to obtain and saw a decrease in circa two levels in those uh, samples. So what happens when there is circa two down regulation and there's a deficit, not only to clear calcium from the cytoplasm, but also how to increase calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum. So the endoplasmic reticulum is an organelle where a lot of things are happening, as you know, protein translation, among other things, that requires a lot of calcium. It has a lot of calcium normally in, 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 inside the organelle. And when those calcium levels are low, as you would expect when circa 2 is downregulated, that can and has been shown to trigger the, uh, um, the UPR response, so the, uh, the unfolded protein response, UPR, that leads to activation of a cascade or a pathway, including PERG, EIF2, alpha, ATF4, and CHOP, which when is sustained can lead to cell death. So 
we reason that perhaps this uh, lack of circa 2 function could be triggering uh, ER stress. And in fact, that's what we observe. I don't want to uh, go into much detail, but just see if you focus on the histograms and the color bar represents each of the proteins, each of the components of the UPR response that we looked at, PERC, PI, F2 alpha, ATF4, CHOP. And you can see that all of those were regulated during ocular hypertension. This was done with flow cytometry, indicating to us that indeed uh, these uh, changes in circa 2 expression were causing endoplasmic reticulum uh, stress. Here I was very interested in uh, testing the idea that perhaps if indeed a circa 2 is downregulating and uh, downregulated and causing all these problems, we could supplement circa 2 by using adeno-associated virus or AAV vector uh, carrying circa 2. And you can see this uh, very nice expression of circa 2 mediated by AAV. Uh, and we can uh, co-localize it uh, with the marker for RGCs, RBPMS, in both uh, flat-mounted retinas and cross-sections. Uh, the expression of this virus lasted for up to a year. That's the longest we measure. It was very abundantly expressed both in the cell bodies and the axons, intraretinal axons of retinal ganglion cells, probably in the optic nerve as well, although we didn't really look there. <clears throat> and uh, more importantly, we can co-localize GCAM6, the calcium indicator, to those cells that have been transfected by the AV2 circa 2, and then uh, explore calcium uh, signaling, uh, signal dynamics uh, in these cells that have the AAV uh, mediated circa 2 upregulation. Just a quick, uh, uh, another quick confirmation that when we measure by flow cytometry the levels of circa 2 after AAV intravitreal injection, we confirmed that this virus in fact uh, induces the upregulation of, uh, by a twofold increase in circa 2 in ret the transfected retinal ganglion cells. So how about the effect? So Hero carried out this a nice uh, analysis of uh, calcium signal uh, images. And let's go straight into the ocular hypertension with the controlled virus, which uh, has the reported gene, but not the circa 2 gene. And you can see that there is a delay in the clearance that is seen uh, as that we characterize as one of the major defects in glaucoma. However, when we uh, injected the AV circa 2 uh, vector, you can see there's this very quick recovery of the clearance capacity of the cells, uh, allowing them to quickly regulate the intracellular calcium and bring it down to basal levels. When we look at the uh, quantification, we confirm that the time that it takes to clear calcium is decreased with the AAV circa 2. And as in previous experiments, the influx and the amplitude were not affected. We were able to confirm uh, these same results in the retinal explants in collaboration with Arjun and Aline. So again, very uh, good a good feeling that our results could be validated in, in another system and in another lab. In addition to uh, increasing the, the calcium clearance capacity of retinal ganglion cells, we were able to, to, to demonstrate that this has an impact on ER function uh, because it was effective, an effective way to reduce uh, those components of the UPR response that I mentioned before. All of them uh, were reduced, you, you just focus on the colored bars, by the expression of AV uh, circa 2 through uh, the AAV. So this is great news because if we uh, were able to decrease ER stress, perhaps uh, we have found a way to modulate retinal ganglion cell apoptosis using uh, this approach. And so in the next set of experiments, Hero, and he did a lot of these, uh, these uh, quantification, he uh, demonstrated that with the AAV circa 2 virus, there is indeed a, a higher uh, retinal ganglion cell density in, in, uh, uh, in this retinas. Uh, compared to the control virus, indicating a neuroprotective effect of AV-mediated circa 2. And to further look at uh, some a little bit more complex responses, such as the optokinetic reflex 
uh, response, which we can measure by using these behavioral tests in which uh, mice are placed in this uh, virtual cylinder and we can use uh, different grading stimuli moving in one direction or another that allows us to quantify head movement, which is an involuntary reflex, we can calculate uh, visual acuity and you can see that AV circa 2 had improved actually visual behavior in uh, the treated mice. So just to summarize this part of the talk, uh, we uh, found that a circa 2 plays a critical role for calcium, the calcium clearance capacity of retinal ganglion cells that is very important for endoplasmic reticular function, survival, and, and visual responses as well. But in glaucoma, in the early stages prior to cell death, we can see that there is a downregulation of circa 2, probably perhaps loss of function as well. And we have some ideas about that, that impair calcium clearance, cause ER stress, and interfere with the ability of these neurons to survive and function. And uh, we also demonstrate that circa 2 uh, gene delivery is a, an effective strategy. We're not saying it's the only strategy, but is an effective strategy and demonstrated to be uh, critical to improve calcium clearance capacity, ER function, survival, and visual behaviors. And I just want to quickly mention that we're extremely happy that this uh, work was uh, just accepted last week in Cell Reports Medicine, so it's now in press and should be published, I don't know, it's coming up soon. I also want to take it just a second to say that Hero is now in the job market looking for uh, positions to start his own lab. So just, just, just wanted to leave that with you. And now I'm going to switch gears just uh, slightly to talk about another type of functional deficits that has been observed in retinal ganglion cells after optic nerve injury, including uh, glaucoma, ocular hypertension. And this is uh, the observation that after axonal injury, uh, one of the earliest responses that is observed in these neurons is the retraction of dendrites and the loss of synaptic contacts. Now, this is not just a fortuitous observation by a lab, you know, random thing. This has been demonstrated and, and proved by uh, many labs around the world using a number of models of axonal and optic nerve injury, and in many different species from zebrafish to even uh, samples of uh, retinal samples from uh, glaucoma patients that uh, confirming that there is indeed uh, indeed uh, dendritic pathology, uh, more specifically retraction of these processes early on during uh, the disease process. So when we started to think about this problem, uh, we had a very naive question really at the time. Uh, it was very simple. We said, well, okay, this is is great, why don't we try to find some way to take retinal ganglion cells from a situation where the dendrites have disconnected and they're they're retracted and not receiving probably enough synaptic inputs from their retinal partners to uh, something that can regenerate their regrow, reconnect and restore circuit integrity because the most important thing in our mind was, well, this circuit uh, may be impaired if there is dendritic retraction. So how do we restore circuit integrity? And we had already done a few years of research into different signaling pathways and different neurotrophic factors. And we had a good inkling that perhaps insulin by activating some of the intracellular pathways could be a good candidate to promote uh, dendritic regeneration in injured retinal ganglion cells. So now I just want to just briefly take a, a few seconds to uh, just tell you that, of course, you know, insulin um, in the context of diabetes, insulin was discovered over 100 years ago by Sir Frederick Banting and his graduate student, Charles Best, at the University of Toronto here in Canada. And uh, he was a, a Sir Frederick Banting, by the way. He went on to win the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1923. Uh, unfortunately, his graduate student didn't win the Nobel Prize, but I always like to say that he was a good supervisor, so he shared the prize money with his graduate student, and I think that's a good that's a good thing. 
and uh, they purified insulin from the pancreas of dogs and then used that to treat diabetic dogs. And of course, the cure to diabetes was born. But what is less known is that insulin is also essential for neuronal functions, for proper neuronal functions. So insulin binds to insulin receptors. By the way, retinal ganglion cells express abundantly insulin receptors. There's activation of an intracellular pathway to promote neuronal function. And in conditions where there's impaired insulin signal or even insulin resistance, even in the absence of diabetes, these neurons are gonna become more vulnerable to injury and it's gonna to lead to neuronal dysfunction and potentially uh, cell death down the line. So we decided to investigate the role of insulin in uh, dendrite regeneration. And this is the PhD project of, the, of a very talented graduate student in the lab, Sana El Aji, who used the magnetic microbead model also to test the effect of insulin on dendritic regeneration. And, and these, these images don't do, um, you know, uh, don't show the, the, the hard work that it is to reconstruct entire dendritic trees of these neurons in three dimensions. Uh, which takes a very long time, but uh, just to simplify showing the data, we, we are just showing you um, a skeletonized representations, two-dimensional representations of dendritic trees of neurons from sham operated controls and those from ocular hypertensive retina, excuse me. And you can see right away uh, that there is dendritic retraction, loss of branches, that these neurons are not doing that great. By the way, these are also alpha retinal ganglion cells. This study was focused on alpha retinal ganglion cells. So you can see that uh, there's loss, there's dendritic pathology clearly. And this is, uh, again, uh, uh, two weeks after induction of ocular hypertension, so way before the cells begin to die or before overt cell death. So we decided, okay, perfect. Let's start insulin treatment here because we want to be able to intervene once there has been damage in these neurons. So that's when we started daily insulin eye drops. And we'll talk a little bit about the eye drops later. But what we saw a few days later and weeks later is that insulin can promote this very robust regrowth, regrowth of dendritic um, arborization, and uh, length, branch length, and complexity relative to vehicle-treated uh, cells or, or eyes. And uh, all the parameters that we measured were improved by insulin. Here I'm just showing you length, area, branches, complexity, but every other parameter that we measured was also improved. Now, how about dendrites? Because the worst thing that can happen is that you make these dendrites grow. Oh, sorry, how about synapses? Uh, because uh, it, it would be problematic if you have a dendrite that grows that has no synapses or no way to communicate with other neurons. So Sana did a lot of work to uh, be able to determine whether insulin also promoted the regeneration of synapses. And for that, she used an adeno-associated virus encoding the postsynaptic density protein 95 uh, with a fluorescent tag, red fluorescent protein tag, and PSD95 is a very important component of excitatory synapses. So what we're looking at here is the localization of PSD95 to excitatory synapses, and that allows us to quantify puncta density and know how many synapses are in these dendrites. And so you can see each of these little tiny balls are um, synapse, excitatory synapses. So this, there's a lot in this slide, and just to make it a little bit simpler to follow. Just please focus on this orange rectangle here. So I can talk a little bit about what happens with synapses during ocular hypertension. This is a high contrast reverse imaging of the, of the PSD95 puncta, which are represented at each, each white dot that you see here is an excitatory synapse on the retinal ganglion cell dendrites. You can even trace the the, each dendritic uh, branch by looking at the distribution of the synapses. And right away, you can see with your naked eye that there's a lot less uh, puncta, excitatory synaptic puncta in ocular hypertension relative to sham. 
And you can also see with your naked eye, if you now move to the orange rectangle to the right, that insulin can very effectively regenerate those synapses. The density of this puncture increases dramatically in insulin-treated eyes relative to saline. And you can see that in, it is in the graph, the, the, the purple bar is the restoration of synaptic um, uh, puncture in uh, the regenerating dendrites. This is in on retinal ganglion cells. And we observe the same exact same in off retinal ganglion cells. And there's another way to analyze these. Again, if you just focus on the uh, orange rectangle here, this was a, a, a type of analysis that Sana thought about, and I thought it was very clever because here she's quantifying the number of puncta along the entire dendritic branch from the soma to the very tip. And it has this beautiful bell-shaped distribution that goes down along the entire dendritic uh, process at two weeks after ocular hypertension, and is very much restored. Or very, there's a, a significant restoration of those synaptic puncta in the insulin treated group, but not in the saline group. So, very nice complementary uh, ways to look at the same phenomenon, which is that insulin can regenerate uh, synapses. Now, let's take a tiny little break here just to talk about a question that you're probably thinking right now. Well, how does insulin get to the back of the eye, to the retina, and does it get there in the first place? Okay, so I'll tell you the first question, we have no idea how it gets there, but we know it gets there because, for example, when we use an insulin that is tagged with the fluorescent label, FITC, and we put an eye drop 15 minutes after we put the eye drop, we can already detect insulin bound to insulin receptors in the retina, something that we never see with unlabeled uh, insulin or vehicle, for example, that I'm showing here as a control. In addition, as early as what well, we can, we haven't looked earlier than 30 minutes, but 30 minutes after insulin eye drops, we can already detect an increase in insulin in the retina by ELISA, there is like a seven to eight fold increase in insulin levels compared to saline uh, treated eyes, which are probably basal physiological levels of insulin within the retina. So that's still within physiological levels, but a, a major increase. There's a lot of variability and we're repeating those experiments now to tighten up these data. Now, a critical question, well, that's great insulin restores dendrites and synapses, but does it restore function? So. Sana collaborated with Hero to look at calcium dynamics. And a uh, long story short, what they found, if you just look at these two traces down here, again, ocular hypertension with saline, there's a delay in calcium clearance, but in the presence of insulin, there's this rapid restoration of calcium to basal levels that is induced by insulin. We're very interested in how this is happening. Uh, we don't know yet, but insulin could be modulating the expression levels of circa 2, or it could be influencing an overall metabolic, um, improving metabolism in these cells, because remember circa 2 is an ATPase, it could respond also to increased energy availability, which could be part of the effect of insulin in this response. So we're, we are very interested in looking, and we'll be looking into these uh, in the next few months. In terms of survival, insulin promoted very nice rescue uh, by increasing the number of retinal ganglion cell density in uh, these uh, retinas, also examined with the cell specific marker RBPMS. And again, to look at uh, visual behaviors, we use the optomotor response that I described earlier and found a very nice. Uh, substantial increase in uh, the uh, visual acuity in my treated with insulin relative to saline. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to um, now talk a little bit, and I know this is not everybody's cup of tea. I love signaling. I want to understand molecular signaling. It's like understanding the all the pieces of the puzzle. But I know a lot of people get bored with this stuff, so I'm just going to give you the gist of it. And anyway, I, I, this paper, by the way, was also um, uh, accepted for publication, but published actually a month ago. So you, if you're interested in details, it's all there. But I, I'm just going to 
quickly tell you the most important things that we learned. And uh, as I mentioned, insulin binds to its receptor and activates AKT. And very important, very importantly, a major target of insulin is the mammalian target of rapamycin, the complex one, which is a master regulator of protein translation. And uh, one of the most important downstream effectors is the ribosomal protein S6 kinase or S6K. And what we found using loss of function experiments that we published a month ago is that when you block S6K, you completely eliminate the regenerative effect of insulin. So S6K, the ribosomal, this ribosomal uh, kinase is, is, is a major component of signaling to promote insulin, regen uh, insulin mediated regeneration. And um, furthermore, we found that S6K acts as a molecular nexus with mTOR2, the mammalian target of rapamycin 2 that regulates cytoskeletal dynamics by activating the stress-related protein once in one, and then back to AK2 to have this uh, uh, very nice uh, positive feedback loop that we think is reinforcing regenerative growth. So this is all, you know, uh, things that we like to do in the lab and they're fun. And, and I think they're important because they may identify uh, noble targets to promote regeneration as well. Now, everything I told you so far was done in mice. Well, how about humans and other species? So we were very lucky to be part of a study uh, by Jason Mayer and his uh, graduate student, Casey Wang. And uh, Jason and his team, what they do is they uh, use a, a human pluripotent stem cell derived retinal ganglion cells to look at all kinds of things. But in this particular study, they were interested in, in looking at uh, insulin and the mTOR pathway, et cetera. So uh, one important aspect is that they can engineer these cells to express, um, for example, the optinurin mutation E50K, which is one of the, uh, actually the most prevalent mutation in normal attention glaucoma. And then they looked at the, the structure of these uh, HPSC-derived retinal ganglion cells in the presence and absence of insulin. What they found is that when these cells are in the presence of insulin, they have these really nice neurites that resemble those seen in wild-type cells. But when you remove insulin, there is this really important retraction of these neurites. Uh, they become shriveled and they have many less processes showing a, a very clear dependency on insulin to maintain those uh, very complex uh, structures that are dendrites. Uh, so uh, they also show that this is a process probably dependent on mTOR because when they use the mTOR, an mTOR inhibitor that actually inhibits both complexes one and two of mTOR, they see this very nice dose dependent response that at the higher doses, uh, this cell is pretty much of just a, a cell body with a couple of little neurons coming out, but all the complexity of these processes is gone in the absence of mTOR function. Now, how about other species and uh, larger species and other models of glaucoma? So we, we've been extremely fortunate to have a, a long time collaboration with my colleague, Brad Fortune at the Legacy Research Institute, who um, is a, a, an expert in using a, a non-human primate model of glaucoma. He, they use uh, rhesus macaque and they induce glaucoma by laser photocoagulation of the trabecular meshwork. Uh, the treatment onset was six months after glaucoma induction. And then they started uh, daily insulin eye drops uh, for four months. So these are very, very long and difficult experiments, specific, particularly because they have to train the monkeys to be able to receive an eye drop. Imagine that, having to train a monkey to receive an eye drop. So uh, after the monkeys had been uh, trained, they were able to do these experiments and, and collect a huge amount of data, of which I'm just going to show a very, very, very small fraction. And so this is... Uh, OCT and, and imaging uh, looking at the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness that is where the retinal ganglion cells are. And we know there's a thinning of this layer with glaucomatous uh, neurodegeneration. And, and there's a lot of data points here, but if you just look at the final 
uh, time point where the data was collected. Uh, in green is insulin and in red is vehicle. Uh, you can see that uh, the vehicle treated animals were worse at the final date uh, of analysis relative to insulin. In addition, they carried out electrophysiological studies using electroretinogram, specifically the, the photopic negative response amplitude. And uh, the photopic uh, negative response is reflects selectively the activity of retinal ganglion cells and is a negative response. So again, if you look at these final data points here in green insulin and red saline or, or vehicle, you see a positive uh, and, and you know you see that there's worsening in the vehicle uh, uh, in the vehicle treated group and and you see a, a positive uh, change because this is a negative response so the more positive the response becomes the worse the outcome and so together this data really uh, supports the idea that insulin is is going beyond the uh, just um, mice and that you know it could be applicable to humans as well and so we've been very lucky to have attracted the attention of the dream team, as I call them, Jeff Goldberg at Stanford University and Chang Chang Wang at the University of Montreal to carry out clinical trials with insulin. They completed phase one and found no adverse effects um, in the patients that were treated with uh, daily insulin eye drops. And now they're preparing the phase two that should begin uh, with patient recruitment uh, this fall. So just to conclude, um, well, I've told you in this second part, a lot of insulin, how it's neuroprotective and promotes functional recovery in mice, also in, in non-human primates. And the ongoing clinical trials, of course, we don't know what's gonna happen. I think that independently of the outcome, uh, we will learn a lot about these trials and it's just exciting to see something moving uh, as a neuroprotective trial for glaucoma. Uh, I just wanna end by Thanking everybody in my laboratory, the current members uh, that are here. I talked about the work of here on Sana, but with the help of everybody else, uh, that has to be said. Past members are collaborators and all the uh, granting agencies for the support. And uh, above all, I, I really thank you for your time and attention today. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Polo. Uh, this is Gulab Zuri. Really nice work. I truly enjoyed your uh, uh, calcium signaling and all the signaling you showed. Uh, thank you. I have, uh, th uh, I have two questions. One was uh, you nicely showed how Circa is involved in the pathway and how it leads to ER stress downstream. Have you explored uh, if reverse is also possible? If the Because people have shown the uh, role of ER stress in glaucoma and CERT. And uh, also, you know, it's quite possible that the ER stress itself can downregulate the uh, circuit uh, receptor. So, absolutely, uh, absolutely, that's a fantastic question. And and we don't really, we can't really tell from the experience that we do when it comes first, the chicken or the egg. But I think those things are tied together. And and I agree with you. It could be that, for example, there are other factors that are inducing ER stress and that cause. Uh, circa two down regulation leading to all of these, um, you know, downstream adverse events. So yeah, it is also possible that the initial, uh, the initial uh, response could be ear stress that could be caused by so many different things, right? But in in our hands, uh, the way that we looked at this, it, it seemed like a, a reasonable sequence of events. But we can't rule out that it could be the other way around. It's a great question. Thank you, and uh. uh... Second question I had, uh, I know you for the calcium signaling uh, indicator, you crossed with Taiwan mice, but not all of the cells were expressing. Is it like because Taiwan is not ubiquitous? Well, no, Ta Taiwan is uh, a very good promoter for retinal ganglion cells, and we get expression in most cells. But what happens is that the levels of expression of the GCAM6 varies among cells. And that's another reason why we focused on the alpha retinal ganglion cells, because they seem to be there, have a large body, so they're easy to identify and easy to record from, and they seem to have a more sort of homogeneous level of GCAM6. So it, I think it's 
something related to how cells process GCAM6 production and, and, and synthesis and, and their expression levels. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I have one question. So in terms of the uh, total eye drops of the insulin. Sorry, who's talking? I, I can't, I, there's so many. I'm um, Kaipa, postdoc from Jodis lab. Okay, um, great, thank um, you. Yeah, so actually I have one question related to the insulin yes. topical eye drops. Yes. yes. So how did you uh, formulate these drops? And is there any specific charge formulation? Ah, well, you know, we, we wanted to do this as, as easily available as possible. So what we're using really is the same insulin used for diabetic patients. So this is humulin, is human insulin. Humulin, you can buy it if you're a diabetic uh, person. And, and, you know, we use those, that formulation as eye drop directly. And it works really well. We are working, however, on uh, a more eye compatible and different formulations of insulin for the future. But just using what's available that is commercially, uh, you know, uh, you can buy it commercially, it works well. So, uh, yes. I, I did, is it my turn to ask the question? I can't tell since I'm remote. Oh, please go but, ahead. Uh, um, I, I can my, my, Okay, I'm Alan Taylor. I have yes. three questions and they all relate to proteostasis effects. Um, one is, as the calcium accumulates, does it rise high enough to activate calpanes? Because that would really wreak havoc in the cells, yes. as you can imagine. And the other one is, does the insulin alter the calcium and the UPR effect? Oh, yeah, those are great what? questions. Very fantastic questions. We we have it. Okay, let me let me start with those because I'm going to forget after you go to the third. So we haven't really looked at calpane activation, but those are such great targets because there is some evidence that calpane activation by itself, these are studies mainly in culture, but they can induce dendritic retraction. So calpane might play an important role in that, that sort of uh, degenerative response. We haven't looked at that yet. But it, it's interesting. And the second one about the role of insulin on the UPR response, we haven't tested that. We haven't tested that. But it's something that <clears throat> begs to be tested because of the effect that insulin has on the calcium response, indicating that this is all linked in some way that we still don't understand. The, the third part of the same theme, at least, is are there any effects on autophagy? when you induce OHT. Yes, yeah, so that was the work of um, Jason Mayer and his student. And 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 this is um, actually, there's a preprint submitted that shows that yes, if, indeed, uh, those uh, that response leads to defects in autophagy and that autophagy plays an important role in, in that dendritic regenerate, the degeneration uh, through mTOR and other pathways. But yes, there is a clear effect of autophagy there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Talk. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Uh, when you see me here, there's a, a fellow who is going to ask me questions. So okay, I that's see. why I'm so colorful today. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, Dr. DiPolo. I really enjoyed the talk. My name is Jan Skersetat. I'm a postdoc with Andrew Brown. Um, I have a question and a reservation regarding your calcium model. Um, I believe your model right now doesn't address the causality the way you presented it. Um, for In order to make my point, would it, would you be able to share one of your early slides where you contrast the, the SWOM versus the OHT? Uh, of course. <clears throat> Let me go back. Uh, yeah, I'll go to the... Perhaps Any of them? You showed a few one. of them. Yeah. <clears throat> Oops. Okay, sorry, let me go back here and put that there. Yeah, this beautiful. One? Exactly. That's um, here. Uh, um, you, you have argued that the recovery of the tau is shallower and use this as a model for uh, uh, differences in OHT and SCAM. But I was wondering why you not describe the entire on to offset. As you can see, when you uh, when we look at OHT plus AAV and so on, yes. the onset is also shallow. 
and the peak seems to be also lower. So I would, from a modeling point of view, expect that you take that into account. Actually, because then, then yes. you would know the, the area on the curve is larger due to both the yes. shadow onset and then it's unsurprising that the delay is also uh, reduced. Of course, and we did take it into account. And But remember, this is just one trace. So we have done thousands of cells mm -hmm. where we take into account all those variations and then come up with something that reflects the entire change in the, the change in the entire population. So if you take every single individual traces, and it's very hard to see, and I agree with you, this is a very narrow view of the responses. Mm -hmm. You can see little variations in little things here and there, but nothing statistically significant in the, in the way that you could tell the entire population is responding in that way. So oh. perhaps in this trace, you can see that, but that's not statistically significant or representative of the actual changes of thousands and thousands of retinal ganglion cells. Yeah, I think the story on the right end tail still holds, but my point is, I think it's not the full story. The full story, if that's true, representative, then the shallow onset in conjunction with the shallow offset uh, probably des describes the, the full story here. Um, yes, and there and there may be other components that need to be analyzed, perhaps deep, more detail to get at other uh, potential mechanisms. You know that could be participating, but we cannot exclude that. For example, you know, intracellular stores are contributing to increasing calcium influx here that we cannot detect. It doesn't seem to alter the rise rate or the amplitude, but we cannot tell that from this data yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hi, Dr. DiPolo. Very nice talk. Um, I'm Cher from Cognitive Science. Um, I'm, 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 I have a question about the neuroprotective effect of um, insulin. And you showed that there is a rescue of the dendritic tree. But I was wondering if you did any receptive field analysis to show whether um, what you rescued is equivalent to the wild type. Yes. So we didn't do it here. In this particular study, we didn't do it, but we have done dendritic field analysis and electrophysiological analysis uh, with uh, a previous approach that although it was an insulin, it activated uh, the insulin pathway by increasing mTOR specifically. And, and we were able to show that response that correlated very nicely with neuroprotection and, and the the the, the um, area of the response of the retinal cell electrophysiologically. But you're right, we need to uh, perhaps invest a little bit of time and effort to go back and, and look at uh, the comparison, for example, between uh, calcium imaging and that type of, of studies that you're suggesting with insulin and to compare and have a better better idea. Yeah, I agree. That, that's something that we could invest a little bit more in. Thank you. Hello? Yes, yes. Hello, <laughs> uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Taipolo. Uh, this is Jian Ye Zhang from Dr. Pachevsky Lab. Um, to me, uh, it's fascinating that uh, insulin uh, can pass through the cornea and the retinal membrane. Mm. And I saw your one image show that there are receptors in ganglion cells for insulin. Its receptors is unique for ganglion cells, and uh, for the fate of insulin, could uh, it target other cells? Yeah. So, so first of all, I want to say that I I never implied that the insulin crosses the cornea and then all the structures of the eye to get to the retina. In fact, that doesn't the data doesn't seem to prove that's the way that insulin gets to the back of the eye because it gets there so fast, as we can detect by immunofluorescence and ELISA, that we think probably it, it goes through the circulation. That's the fastest way to get there. Somehow insulin can uh, reach the circulation really quickly and then get to the retina. And now I have to also clarify that uh, it does it without reducing the levels of glycemia. So this is, was a really important thing for us and also for the phase one clinical trials to show that insulin eye drops do not decrease the sugar levels in the blood because that would have been uh, really complicated with glaucoma patients. And sorry, I forgot the second question. <laughs> Can you repeat? Yes. 
um, for the retinal uh, insulin receptors. Ah, uh, yes, uh, yes. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you. Yes, the insulin receptors. So yeah, yeah, that's that's fascinating. Insulin receptors are expressed in practically every neuron, uh, or at least in the retina, we see very abundant expression in the inner nuclear layer and the ganglion cell layer, and also in the endothelial cells. So insulin could be affecting more than just the retinal ganglion cells. And, and we're beginning to look into that, especially, for example, how insulin may affect vasculature and how vasculature could influence the regenerative response. It's gonna take a little bit of time to figure out how other cells are contributing to dendritic regeneration, but it is completely possible. Let's move to Zoom and we have questions there. Yes, it's where you. Yeah. Yeah, hey. Oh, hi, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so this is way from our Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, very nice talk. So thank uh, you. I enjoyed it. So uh, thank you. Probably I missed something. So it's a uh, uh, first question: is How you come up to um, circle in this uh, OHT model? And then the second question is: How this uh, ocular hypertension caused the uh, circle de deficit? Yes. So, sorry. Can you repeat the first question? I, how, I didn't... Uh, the first question is: How you come up to? Uh, how, uh, how you come up to this this uh, uh, circular molecule? So it's uh, uh, I know it is involved this. Uh, um, oh, the circuit too. Okay, yeah, I get uh, it. Uh, oh, I see. Yes, clearance, yes. but yeah, probably yeah, yeah. you have many molecules. Yes, yes, so you yes. Somehow you focus on this. So. Of course, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what we did when we started seeing this calcium clearance deficits is we looked at all the different mechanisms that could contribute to calcium clearance in the cell. And then we, as you say, it's very complex. It's not just circa two. There's uh, mitochondrial uh, pathways that are involved in uptake, uh, the calcium uptake. There's membrane. And we used a pharmacological approach, uh, inhibitors and activators of each of these pathways, and then recorded the, the, these longitudinal uh, studies to record whether they produced any changes that could be phenocopy or mimic the alterations that we saw in glaucomatous neurodegeneration. And the one that fit the, the bill in terms of the observations that we were making at the time was the circa two, uh, the circa two uh, modulation, pharmacological modulation that we were doing. Now that doesn't completely eliminate that any other pathways of clearance could be involved, but if they are, they're not, they don't have the same either kinetics or that, that fit that calcium response or they were not really altered at all. So uh, because of that, we were able to narrow down to circa two. Again, that doesn't exclude that other pathways could be involved, but our data supported primarily a role for circa two. Yeah, the, uh, the second question, how does uh, ocular hypertension cause the uh, circuit uh, deficit? <laughs> yes, so that's a really great question. And, and it goes back to th that other question that was asked. Well, first of all, we know from single cell RNA seq analysis and a lot of studies that have been done in, in single cell transcriptomics that uh, ocular hypertension causes the downregulation of a large number of genes in retinal ganglion cells that may not may not all of them may be relevant but some of them are certainly very relevant we don't know how that happens but it is a phenomenon that has been observed by a lot of people including us and there are some key genes that are that ca can have a functional effect so we think circa 2 could be one of them and down regulation of that through ocular hypertension can cause problems. The other one is goes back to the question that was asked earlier. Could it be that ocular hypertension is just inducing an, an overall stress in, in organelles? We know that there's a stress in mitochondria. ER could have also uh, different uh, levels of stress during glaucoma, and that itself could lead to circa 2 down regulation. Is that cause effect uh, question that is so difficult to answer <laughs> experimentally. It's a so good is, question, but very difficult to, to answer. There is the circuit two is one of the um, differential express gene in that uh, transcriptome analysis you just mentioned. Sorry? It's so is the uh, circuit two is one of a differential yes. express gene? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes, absolutely. 
All right, we have many more questions, but I will give a chance to ask a question by beautiful Dan. Dan! <laughs> Hi, Dan! Hey, Adriana. <laughs> uh, yeah, so my question is is related to, to Wei's question. It was uh, why and how circuit two is downregulated and related to the mechanical stress and specifically the energetics of the cell is being stressed out yes. much more because of the atp demand of surf. exactly <clears throat> so we and that's a great question that we are going to answer that we can answer so so yeah the simplest thing to explain this is down regulation but we don't think it's the whole story you know it's an atpas it requires atp we have demonstrated that at those early stages there's a reduction in ATP availability. And we know that, for example, insulin can uh, perhaps increase the metabolic resilience of these cells and, 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 and glucose meta through glucose metabolism, which is something we're testing now. And that's why we see that very fast recovery with insulin. So yes, we definitely think there's an energetic requirement here that it's very important. And we hope that we can link it all together through uh, ATP dependency, perhaps glucose metabolism and the effect of insulin. So hopefully in a few years, we'll have more answers, but it's a, it's a, we're, we're thinking along those lines. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, last four questions here from the room. Hi, Dr. DiPolo. Uh, thank you so much for that really interesting talk. Thank My you. name is Zach, and I'm a PhD student with Dr. Polcheski. Um, so forgive me, I'm a little unfamiliar with like RTC degeneration and the OHT model, but I was wondering if you anticipate that there is a spectrum of resilience in different RGC cell types or cell subtypes. Um, and is this kind of spectrum of resilience, like calcium resilience, uh, dependent on baseline activity, like baseline synaptic activity? Or... That's such a fantastic question. Very good question. Thank you for that. So yes, we know that there's a spectrum of uh, resilience uh, that these uh, retroganglion cells present. And there's some molecular signatures that have been associated with that. For example, um, um, Mm, alpha retinal ganglion cells are among some of the uh, the resistance category. The melanopsin expressing uh, cells are also more resistant. Uh, and so there's beautiful work done by Josh Sainz and his group where they did both things, uh, where they did uh, molecular characterization and then look at how these cells responded to, for example, optic nerve crush or other forms of injury, and they were able to identify uh, these very nice uh, different responses to injury and resiliency. I, I don't know if anybody has done, and I don't think anybody has done uh, a correlation with calcium dynamics, mm -hmm. as far as I know, um, but uh, that would be really interesting to look at different molecular, uh, different subtypes of retinal ganglion cells and then correlate that uh, calcium dynamics response with how well they survive after injury. Yeah, that's, yeah, that, that's a really good idea. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Dr. DiPolo. This is Vladimir Kefalov. I'm here in the audience. Uh, oh, following hey. up on Zach's question, who kind of asked us uh, saw my question, but there is actually recent work by Phil Williams uh, in, in St. Louis who showed that calcium homeostasis actually correlates with the susceptibility to degeneration in ganglion cells. And so my question to you would be, did you look at the expression of CIRK2 in different alpha ganglion cells or in different ganglion cells in general to see whether it correlates again with the susceptibility to degeneration overall? Yes, actually, the all the studies that we did with CIRK2 expression were done in all subtypes. We didn't discriminate, we didn't uh, distinguish all the different cell types, we just did <clears throat> mostly um, flow cytometry that uses all retinal ganglion cells or RBPMS that will recognize all uh, retinal ganglion cells. And it was very consistently among most subtypes. We didn't do a specific characterization of different subtypes. And yes, I, I know the work of Phil Williams is he's doing really nice work. Our results are a little bit different. He looks at overall levels of calcium in the retinal ganglion cells and can uh, correlate them with the uh, resilience. We are looking mainly at calcium dynamics, how that signal is changing rather than the overall 
levels of calcium in the cells. And, and we think it, that is predominantly uh, something shared by all, by, by most RGC types, not just the alpha RGCs. I hope I answered your question. I'm not sure. Yeah, thank you. Again, I was wondering whether you looked at the expression of CIRK2 in different ganglia cells, but it sounds like that's probably- We did it. Yeah, we didn't we didn't look in specific subtypes. We looked at the entire population. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the amazing talk, Dr. Dipper. This is Priya yeah. again. Thank um, you. So I have uh, two questions, one, one from each topic. Uh, so the rescue of uh, RGC phenotype following uh, circa 2 gene augmentation was very convincing. So have you tried uh, the same gene augmentation therapy um, in a chronic condition where significant damage has already occurred to the RGCs? That was my first question. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, my second one is uh, regarding the dendrite degeneration. So you mentioned that um, mTOR inhibition has an association with the degeneration of the dendrites. mTOR mm -hmm. inhibition, again, is going to uh, activate or deactivate a lot of downstream pathways. One among them is the deactivation of, I mean, sorry, activation of autophagy. So you think? Do you think there is an association between uh, autophagy, like increase in autophagic flux, and then the dendrite degeneration? So these are my two questions. Yes. Yeah, so I'll start with the first, the last one because I I forgot already about the first one. But uh, yeah, So there is a, this collaboration which we we don't really look at. We haven't really looked at autophagy that much. But we know mTOR is a major component of autophagy. But Jason Meyer has and his team looked uh, more carefully at that in his uh, pluripotent stem cell derived uh, retinal ganglion cells. So uh, there is a correlation between uh, our mTOR changes, so changes in mTOR activity and autophagy, and that leads to neurodegeneration, including changes in the dendritic alteration and dendritic alterations. So I, I highly suggest that you read this work that is uh, now in re under review, but there's a preprint uh, on uh, in BioArchive, I believe, uh, that talks about exactly the, the relationship between mTOR and autophagy and potentially insulin. I know, can you remind me of the first question I, I forgot? Already. Okay, so this is like, did you perform a gene augmentation in a chronic, uh... Uh, ocular hypertension model. So the the model that we're using is a chronic ocular hypertension oh, model. Okay. Actually, it's it's a model that lasts for many many weeks and and, and months in our hands, and so we can test uh, much longer periods. Except the study so far, uh, we have just looked at um, several weeks, but not months. But but and we we can see an effect of, of AAV circa two augmentation, but. You know that so so it's just a matter of you know taking the time to uh, look at longer time points, which we'll probably do at some point. Thank you. Hey Adriana, this is Dorota. Hi hey, Dorota. And, uh, <laughs> How are you? I, yeah, I'm good, and thank you so much for your for sharing with us your wonderful work. Thank you. So I guess, um, Two questions. Uh, one is, um, how long is the effect of insulin um, for this increased arborization? I realized you are doing daily dosing for monkeys, but oh no, yeah, um, but I don't know if it is necessary. And um, actually, the following um, would so, be- so, so you're asking for in mice or monkeys, the effect of insulin? So actually, how long is the effect in your- model on oh, yeah uh, so so we've looked at um up to what well, depends on the on the model for the glaucoma for the, we've done this also in the exotomy model which is a very is acute um acute mm -hmm. injury and we looked for up to 12 weeks and we still saw a neuroprotective regenerative effect with the glaucoma model it's been um shorter i think the maximum we've looked is for six weeks something like that so again it's just a matter of you know, trying to, uh, you know, uh, see mm -hmm. what's uh, the priority and, and look at longer time points, exactly. But um, we haven't looked at months and months, no. But the monkey works, the monkey work is, is perhaps better, a better example, because uh, uh, these are monkeys that were analyzed uh, six months after, so for a lot more months because treatment began at six months after the induction of glaucoma and then treatment was for four months mm -hmm. so there's a that those represent i think a better sort of more chronic really chronic more 
perhaps more comparable to what would be in humans, although again, months doesn't correlate to years in humans of the disease. But if a monkey can have neuroprotection at 10 months mm -hmm. after glaucoma induction, I think it's pretty incredible. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I, where I was going at. And the um, second question is a little bit uh, maybe more uh, to, so I can learn from you. How do you, um, so your work is showing that there is a lot of mechanisms starting in soma. So how do you deal with questions or people that are saying that all uh, glaucomatous problems starts in accents and in optic nerve head? Yes, thank you for that question, which I hate because uh, you know since I started this uh, working in this area, that has that has always been the dogma, right? That um, injury of retinal ganglion cell axis in the optic nerve head is where the primary injury site is, and that's what leads to all the rest of the changes in glaucoma. But I had to tell you that you know after 24 years of looking at these, I'm I'm not that convinced. I I know a lot of people would not be open to talking about these <laughs> or or to change their views. But I think it is a type of disease that affects a lot more than just the optic nerve head. I am not sure that I would dare to say that's not the primary side because I, I would be eaten alive by a lot of people. But I would say that. A lot of uh, changes happen in other places besides the optic nerve head, and the retina is a perfect example of that because a lot of the changes that we've seen early on before the onset of neurodegeneration or overt neurodegeneration are clearly, clearly identified in the retina even before we see any changes at the optic nerve head or in axons even. So... You know, oh, uh, all right, a, so we're I coming try, to the to end. Yeah. Uh, Adriana was really fantastic. And Thank I hope you. We got a lot of questions. We will finish with one final question. And again, wow. I wanted to thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Oh. Thanks for the chance to, uh, this is Ray Chen uh, and the audience. I really thank for the opportunity to ask. Fantastic work. I really thank enjoyed you. both story. I just want to follow up on the insulin one, right? I'm particularly intrigued by the potential of translational aspect of that. So uh, I'm, one, I'm thinking about, you know, compare the model, animal model use and then human condition like POET. Um, uh, you know, do you, people have, have done a lot of GWA study on the, you know, the POET condition? Has insulin or insulin related genes come up in any of the GWAS hit? The second thing is, uh, Looking at type one diabetic patient where you have much lower insulin, you know, production, do people see any observed RTC or glaucoma type of diseases? Yeah. yeah, that's a those are two really fantastic questions. So there have been some GWA studies that are uh, you know, in in um in, in using glaucoma patients and identify the number of genes. Uh, to my knowledge, nothing specifically related to insulin, but a lot related to metabolism, mitochondrial function, and maybe even glucose metabolism that could be associated with insulin. And uh, your so that is something that we should continue to monitor and continue to investigate to see whether we can find some more direct genetic association. Um, but, and the, the, sorry, can you remind me the second one, the second question I had? The ah, yeah. yes, yes. Yes, so that's a really excellent question. And I get asked that a lot about the diet, people with diabetes. And um, so this has been a controversial issue for a long time in which there were no real correlative studies from clinically showing a correlation between glaucoma and diabetes. But more recently, uh, I that I think there has been some progress made in the field and uh, recent studies really suggest that there is a correlation between glaucoma and diabetes. But what is more important here is that the more convincing studies uh, demonstrate an, a potential association between glaucoma and type 2 diabetes, which is really, really along the lines of what we're showing, because if it is true that insulin acting through its insulin receptor is required for the maintenance of these dendritic trees and for, uh, you know, for uh, neuroprotection, then uh, patients that have type 2 diabetes, which are uh, resistant to insulin, then there would be more expected to have uh, retinal ganglion cell degeneration and damage of their dendrites or whatever the entire neuron probably would be damaged. So 
of course, this is all speculation. We have no idea, but it is very likely that there is uh, some mechanistic link between type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance in glaucoma patients. So that's very exciting for us. Uh, please join me. Sorry? 